morning. Oh, come on, guys. Go wake up a little bit. Good morning. All right. So uh, first off, before we get to the end, don't ask me any of those tricky technical questions. I'm not a technical guy. I'm a marketing guy. So we let the technical details fall to the other people. Uh, so we'll try to come up with the ideas, but we'll let them handle the problems. But anyway, let me just kind of give you a setup in terms of uh, who we are, who Anheuser-Busch is as a company. Uh, Anheuser-Busch is part of Anheuser-Busch InBev. Uh, we're the number one global brewer in the world. Uh, we're one of the top five global CPGs. Uh, you may have heard we recently um, are in the process of completing the acquisition of Grupo Modelo, which on a global basis will add Corona to this list. Um, we have the most valuable alcohol brand in the world, and that's Budweiser. When you see different listings of brands and, and brand valuations, Budweiser always rises to the top, and it's one of the key brands that we're globalizing around the world. We're the top U.S. brewer, and within our portfolio, we have 14 brands of over a billion dollars in sales. And to give a sense of our U.S. business, our U.S. business is about $16 billion, sale, $16 billion in sales. So one of the key things that we always talk about is that beer is the original social network. And if you look on the left, there's, a, there's an image there from Mesopotamia. It's about 4,000 years old, or maybe it's more than that. It's from 4,000 BC. We, we always refer back to that from the context of when people started getting together uh, and from the very beginnings of society and civilization, beer was there. Beer was part of that, uh, that coming together for the human community. And we, we really respect that, and we believe that beer plays a fundamental role in that. Now, the thing that's changing is, is that we have been that ever-present part of the physical world. You know, beer, coming together, going to the pub, going to the bar in your neighborhood. It was a physical, social experience. But now you're starting to see how we blend with the digital world. And the digital world is very real. It's very part of consumer behavior. You heard the earlier speakers speak of how people's behavior was changing or is changing because of the interaction of having instant access to information at all times, at any time, with them uh, from a device. And one of the things I always find amusing is, is start walking around, walk around New York City. How many times are you walking down the street and there are people who are focused with their phone in front of them? They're walking down the street. Their physical world has changed because the physical world is now this far away and they're interacting with a broader world around them completely because of the innovation of having that device that has connectivity uh, to the entire, to, to the entire uh, universe for all intents and purposes in front of them. So we have to be ready for that. And I can tell you from experiences from, I worked at several companies before I came to Anheuser-Busch. And one of the lessons that I'd learned uh, working in my prior company is that you have to pay attention to history. And I worked at a confectionery company that there were two periods in time in the history of its uh, development of its market performance that it had a setback. There was a period of time when it wasn't an, earlier an early adopter in radio in the 20s. And guess what? That company's market share fell. Then there was a period of time in the 50s and late 40s when that company was a late adopter to television. And guess what? Its market share fell. So one of the things that I've always carried for me as a mantra, having learned from what has happened before, is don't let that happen to me and the businesses that I work on. So I've always championed driving leadership position with what we're doing from a digital standpoint because that's where things are going. That's the next thing, and it's the thing now. So we need to be prepared. So one of the ways that we're preparing at AB is that there is a very good process for folks who are used to the CPG world that we use for development of products. It's called StageGate. And it creates a process for you to have what we call an innovation engine that generates ideas constantly, but it's in a controlled, methodical approach. So we've taken the StageGate process and applied it to our digital approach so that we are constantly driving uh, a process where we have the identification of problems, we have a funnel being generated of ideas. Those things get concepted. We test them, and we go through a stage gate process to kick those things constantly in the market. We always want to have an innovation factory driving the development of our digital approach going forward. 
And the other point too was, to have leadership in digital, you have to be where the action is. And one of the, one of the things that uh, my company was very proud, and I think was very visionary in doing, and no one really talks about it, is that we had a presence in Palo Alto years before it became now, it's kind of the in thing for CPG companies and other companies to have a presence in Palo Alto. We were there three, four years ago with a presence there. And now more, more recently, I moved my digital team there. Uh, and the reason is twofold. First one is, is we want to have access to people and the ideas. So by being physically present in Palo Alto, in the valley, we're there where the action is. You can have instant access and have those immediate discussions with the people who are uh, in, the, in the cutting edge of what's happening from a digital standpoint. The other part is a mindset. Um, I, spend a, I spend a good amount of time going back and forth to Palo Alto. And one of the things that I would say is, is that there's a, there's a, a mood and a clim climate that's infectious. When you go, you feel the energy of people who are doing new things, doing different things. They're doing edgy things and taking risks. You know, people giving up their you know, stability of their jobs to take a bet on whether or not this idea they have can become something that enables them to make it. So for us, we want to be there. And I want that attitude and that culture to pervade my digital team to make sure that they're going ahead and taking the chances and pushing the boundaries to make sure that Anheuser-Busch uh, is a leader in the digital space. Now this one is a slide I'm not going to dwell upon because you guys know it all more than all of us, than any of the marketing guys do. You know, smartphone penetration is exploding. You know, it's, it's, it's above 50, if I remember correctly. And some folks are saying it's stabilizing out in the, in the 50s. My perception is, and I don't know if anyone in the, great, in the room would disagree, it's going to eventually be all phones because the price is going to continue to drop. You're not going to be able to buy a, a, a singular function phone. There will always be a smart device. So penetration is going to be basically everyone in a short order of time. This is the exact chart you saw earlier. And, and for me, just to point out, what, what's the thing I'm paying attention to? You know, I have to pay attention to the time spent and the ad spend. You know, so if you see 10% of people's time focused on mobile and only 1% of the spend there, there's probably a difference. I think there has to be an acknowledgement, though, we have to be considerate of the actual experience on a device. I, you saw the, um, that come up earlier in the conversations this morning. Because how you bring that experience to life is going to be important to how much money that you're actually going to put in mobile. But the point is, no matter how you call it, no matter what the experience is on the device, the amount of money that companies need to put in mobile is going to increase. So everybody here in this room is in a good spot uh, because uh, it, it looks like there's going to be a lot of money flowing into this area, a lot of money flowing this area from potentially other uh, advertising mediums over the next several years. Now, the thing that we want uh, is, and, and this is a discussion we have quite a bit, is that we want to create useful and engaging experiences that help our consumers enjoy their lives. So there's a lot of focus against making sure that what we're doing is not about just doing something to do it. If I'm, if I'm bringing a digital experience and mobile to consumers and just to, oh, I have a new promotion out, so I want to do something from a promotional standpoint, it's not going to really enhance our business or it's not going to enhance my relationship with that consumer who's doing it. And I'm going to talk about mobile apps a little bit more and some of the other things that we're doing. The other thing that's absolutely important, especially for companies like mine, is scale matters. And I have to do it in an efficient way. Because we don't have the scale, and this is true in terms of what we do in the physical world with our beers and our brands. We're a company that's set up to do things very big. And so to try to do a bunch of small things becomes very difficult for us to manage from an organizational standpoint, from a complexity, a management standpoint, an investment standpoint. So we want big things that have scale that we can be very efficient in. But we won't let that stand in the way of innovation. The way we think about it is we're willing to do a bunch of small things. We're willing to do a bunch of things to innovate. But the point is at some point they must re yield something that's scalable and can be big. Now, let me just kind of go through some of the top, tessons, the top 10 lessons 
that we have learned, and I'll, some of these examples I've been directly involved with, and I'll tell you some funny stories, but uh, they're very important to us because I think one of the other key points about any organization that stays in a leadership position is two things. One, you always have to learn from your mistakes, and you have to admit the mistakes. I think, and, and uh, what's funny is, is that uh, in my introduction, there was a, a call out of one of the things that was great. Uh, we actually look at that as something that we made a mistake on, so I'll talk about that. But you gotta learn from your mistakes and always feel nervous. Because if you don't feel nervous about what you're doing, that you're not ahead of everybody else, you're gonna be comfortable. So I'd say the other thing about anybody in this room, don't ever get comfortable about where you're at in your position. You have to feel nervous that someone is gonna catch you and that'll keep you ahead. So this one, you'd be surprised about, uh, from an organizational standpoint, how many times I've been into, I've come into a team and they don't have a clear defined strategy of what they want to accomplish in any media. And so the first starting point of having uh, a strong approach is to make sure that you have a clear strategy. You have to align your business needs so it's no great mystery that we're in sports, it's no great mystery that we're in music and entertainment and that a lot of our brands have to do with people out at night. So, you know, and then within that, we want to activate against several, tech, several technical platforms. You know, mobile, social, interactive. But what we want to make sure is, is that we have a framework. If you don't have a framework, you're not going to succeed because you're going to always be wandering. You're not going to have a North Star to guide what you're up to. And so, you know, one of the top 10 things that we've learned is, and the most important one, is to have a strategy that you apply and use to guide what you're doing. Now, the second one. This was the example that was used. So we, we developed this really cool mobile app. One of the things that our company has an enormous uh, capability in, that if you're in the industry, one of the things that's recognized is, is our leadership in brewing. Our capability in brewing around the world is unmatched. Uh, we are in the industry recognized for our attention to detail, the quality of the ingredients that we use, um, and the, the, the training and quality of our brewmasters, because many of the brewmasters that you see out in the industry, out in the craft community, are actually guys that started at AB. So the thing that we want to do is start telling the story of what we do from a brewing standpoint. We created a mobile app called Track Your Bud, which allows you to put in a date that's on the bottle, the born on date, and a, and a code, and it will tell you exactly where the brew, where the, the beer came from. We have 12 breweries in the US. It tells you um, when it was made, gives you some of the history, and it gives you details about the ingredients that we use. It also gives you a, a, a quick introduction to the, to the brewer responsible for that brewery, the head brewer. And so it was a really cool thing, and it was fantastic. But what we learned is, is that because we made it an app, we probably didn't get the participation levels that we could have if we just made it a uh, web-enabled uh, function. So the learning for us here is, is don't app if you don't have to. If it's something you can do online, especially today with uh, the capability, do that. And now, if you've seen, we've just relaunched this. So we have new commercials online telling the story of our local, you know, the 12 breweries we have in the US. We're showing some of the folks that we have that have been the longtime brewers of our company, that actually are the guys that trained a lot of the brewers that you see out in the craft community. So we're, we're starting to tell that story. Now you can go in, put it in, it's online, everybody can do it. There's not a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, trouble to go get an app and put it on the phone. So now you can just go to trackyourbud.com and do the exact same functionality. Now here's the other one too. And that's the point about, yeah, I'm looking for scale I'm looking for things that we can do big, but you can't make that be a barrier to experimentation. So the company very early on was doing things with um, augmented reality. And so we, in 2009, had done something with Stella Artois called the Labar Guide. We learned a bit. We learned some of the things that worked, some of the things that didn't work. And then going forward, though, we've learned that we can continue to do it and bring fun to the consumer and use augmented reality as a way to enhance the brand. And we built retail programs. So going on to that, we, went to, we did something with our NASCAR initiative with Budweiser. We also did something with Walmart and uh, m multiple brands that we have. Again, one with Budweiser with the NASCAR program. So we connected with a retailer, Walmart, biggest retailer, connected with Blipper, 
brought augmented reality in our brands, and that works. So this early experiment in 2009 with Stella yielded insights that led to what we did this year, or in 2012, with Budweiser on NASCAR and with Walmart. This one here, this one here too. So the, one of the things that um, is a benefit of not being a technical guy uh, is that I feel like I, when I engage, I have two phones. I have a, a, a Galaxy and I have an iPhone. And one of the things that's a benefit of, of being able to go look at the devices and fool around but not really being a technical guy is probably my experience is more like a consumer. You know, and I can tell you that you know, I still haven't figured out everything on my Galaxy and how to move stuff around and you know, get it set up. You know, there's, so I'm a real person really engaging with a device probably like everybody else. So when, the, when my team brings on a, a, a app, when I interact with it, it needs to be simple. It needs to work, it needs to engage, it can't be a pain in the ass, and it can't be something that you know, I need to be an uh, MIT uh, web developer to understand and get it to work. So the important point here is, is just to make sure that when you're working on stuff, make sure that it works and it brings utility and it brings a lot of fun. And one of the successes that we had last year in focusing on that is we had a Bud Light NFL app. So Anheuser-Busch through our Bud Light brand is the official sponsor of the NFL. And one of the things that we want to do is you know, we want to bring a NFL fan experience to folks by, from Bud Light but it just can't be a bunch of you know, Bud Light logos jumping around on the screen. Because how long is a guy going to be on, the, on his phone if that's all you deliver? So we put together a really cool, very engaging app that the average time spent on it was 54 minutes and the average rating was four stars. So again, just through the simple approach, like is it fun, is it entertaining, is it engaging, and is it making sure that we're doing the thing that we want it to do is let people have fun but our brand is there as an enabler to that fun. And that leads to my next point. Be fan-centric and not brand-centric. You know, one of the funny visuals we often use is that it's easy to fall into the trap of looking at consumers as just, here's a guy with a Budweiser bottle. All he does is think about Budweiser. And I'm sure that, in, and I had that same issue when I worked in the confection category. We had that same issue when I worked in the Ready Eat cereal category. People often fall in this trap of just thinking about their consumers, that their entire world revolves around that one brand. That's not how it works. You gotta be realistic. For most of the businesses that we work on, uh, a consumer's thoughts on it are fleeting. And in 90, probably 5% of the products that are out there, people don't care. They don't give a shit about your brand. They don't care about your category. And you have to be realistic that you gotta fight for their attention every day, every minute, every moment. And that's just the truth. So when you're bringing an experience to these folks, you've got to do it right. So early on, we had a very brand-centric ABI brand um, bar finder. And what happened is, you know, it, it was an experience where people could only find information about our brands, and it was a, it was a big turnoff. We, didn't get the, we did not get the engagement uh, with that application that we had wanted. Then when we did something that was more fan-centric, fan zone, you know, where we're using multiple brands on a second screen and it was around sports ga gaming, it worked. So make sure that the consumer remains the center and not the brand. Because if it just becomes about the brand, it's going to be really, really tough to drive the engagement. Now here's, now here's my funny story. So one of, the things, um, you know, it, one of the things I'm very proud about is a Stella app, that, or a Stella uh, application that we put together. Or uh, I should say Stella... Uh, uh, mobile uh, Stella app. So it involves Alice Eve, and I don't know if you guys have seen uh, Star Trek, the new Star Trek movie that comes out. She plays Dr. Carol Marcus, very attractive lady, fits the Stella Artois brand, very sophisticated, elegant, beautiful woman. And so we had this program that worked at Google that you could type in someone's address, and it made it look like that she was driving to your house. And she, and, and you, she would ring your doorbell, and it would open up, and she would sing you a song, a Christmas Carol. That's what we call it. Uh, it was called a Carol. And, and behind it, you would see like your neighborhood. So like when I put my address in, you know, it made it look like she was driving through St. Louis, driving to my house, and then when, when the door opened up to look at her, behind her was the guy's house across the street. So it looked like she was actually singing the song on my porch, you know, with uh, with her band. 
So I'm all excited. I'm at home. I have my iPad. I want to show my wife and my, my in-laws, oh, check out this cool app. You know, and uh, I, get, I find out that it doesn't work. Guy's building in Flash. So I call, my, I call, I call the, 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 the person responsible. I'm like, hey, man, this thing doesn't work on my iPad. What's going on? Uh, okay, let me look into it. You know, like five minutes later, I got a phone call back. Just like, you know, the, it was uh, Thanksgiving. Oh, you know, we built it in Flash. Well, guess what? It better work on next year on, uh, on mobile because we cannot make that kind of fundamental mistake. So the fundamental mistake that you have to make, you have to do is everything has to be mobile enabled. You can't develop this fantastic program and not have it work on mobile because of the, of the, of the technology. We won a ton of awards. It was highly recognized for being creative and kind of how we integrated the use of uh, Street View from Google. But then we screwed up because we didn't use it. We didn't create it to, uh, we didn't create it. And because of mobile and mobile's importance with scale, we were never able to get this thing scaled up the way we could have. So you'll see next year, it will work. We fixed it. You're going to see this initiative uh, roll with, uh, with her uh, uh, in, uh, in next Christmas under Stellar Trois. The other thing is, how many of you folks have seen uh, the new Star Trek movie? All right, you reckon, remember, Bob is still, still around in the 23rd century. So that's a, that's a good point. OK, let me. Uh, Jump on to the next one. I, I talked about this early on about how we create an innovation stage gate process. One of the things that's really important for us is to make sure that uh, from, a, from both a expectation standpoint and from a culture standpoint, you always approach things in the focus against constant creative iteration. So early on, we were, you know, as mentioned, very early on, we were one of the first companies that advertised with Apple on IAD. You know, and one of the things, though, that we learned is we could do things a lot better. So by doing things better through creative iteration, we had a 3.3% increase in our click-through rate. You know, so we were able to do things better from how we did it before to how we do it now and get that kind of increase. And so just right there, from that example, we had a 48% increase in IAD performance in our click-through rate. And I'm not going to bore you with the specifics, but the important, the point I want you to take away is, is that just because you have something doesn't mean you stop. Even in the things that have worked uh, and worked well, you've got to continually and constantly iterate from a creative standpoint. The other one for us, too, that's important, and, and there's a lot of facts about the penetration of mobile with Latino consumers. The other thing that's extremely critical for the beer business is that Latino consumers our extremely young population. And the other thing that's important for us is that it's a, a population that over-indexes on beer. So beer, uh, beer consumption is much better with Latinos than with uh, general market. So for us, we have to continue to do well there. We've done very well there historically, and we need to continue to do well there and innovate. So some of the things that we've done, for example, is we had a spot with a, an artist named Pitbull, and we, we made it Shazamable. And when we made it Shazamable, we, we didn't know what would happen. It was not a, a major initiative, but it worked for us. We got a lot more than well. I think we had 60,000 people Shazam it and go to, the, uh, go to the extended content. And what people saw was is then they went into it and they saw additional footage, making of the commercial, additional, you know, a longer, a longer soundtrack. But it was a small thing, but it ended up having a good result. And one of the things that we've done, we've also done this with uh, Super Bowl, and we've been very, very, very successful in exploiting using these types of approaches with Super Bowl. And that's the point with, with the next one, is that advertising on platforms of scale. So the two examples that I have is, is one with Shazam and one with Pandora. So we, in uh, Super Bowl in 2012, had a, uh, a commercial with LMFAO. And in it, we had, uh, we had uh, a Shazam tag, and within five minutes of it running, we had been able to give people 400,000 music downloads. So put it on the Super Bowl, get a huge view. Within five minutes, we were able to create a Bud Light branded experience through Shazam where people were downloaded 400,000 songs. So huge, huge, um, huge, huge opportunity where we leveraged a scale platform to build our business. 
The other one that we did, and this was on platinum, was for Pandora. And what we did in that one is, is we used Pandora to extend the reach of it. And in that particular case, again, it was a Super Bowl unit partnering with Pandora. We were able to have a, an example of an activation that gave us the highest click-through rate of any brand in Pandora's history, any alcohol brand in Pandora's history. So very, very successful. But for us, again, you know, when, when people come to us with ideas, one of the things is I'm open to starting small. But ultimately, we have to have platforms, and uh, we have to go there. On to the next one. And this is don't be afraid of ideas, but also killer ideas do get killer results. One of the things that we did, and this was where we used a, a fake app. We created a, a, name, a fake company called 4-1 Adventures. It played on April Fool's Day. And we put out an app that told people that you could now smell the beer through your iPhone. And, um, we actually had people or through your iPad, and we actually released it, and people were convinced. There's the woman on TV, this is footage from a screen grab, where they thought they were trying to get it to work. Then we released that it was fake. We had huge uh, impact, and uh, the net number was we had over 30 million earned media impressions, and in that period, shock top sales were up over 78% because it's a small brand getting to build awareness. So it was a big idea, big results, and again, where you could have fun and build engagement with your consumer. So that's our show. That's what we've been learning. And uh, take a few questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, much Paul. Paul Scheib. Any, while, we, uh, while we move to questions, I want to let everybody know we have some seats down in front. So please, uh, those of you who are standing back, we do have some, uh, some seats on front. So grab them. Uh, questions for Paul? Here we go. Oh, over here. Sure. Uh, Kevin Wasson with Lynn Mobile. Um, I thought it's great in terms of the apps that you're building. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the app distribution strategies that you're employing after you build these apps, how you're getting them out in the marketplace more broadly to, to get uh, adoption. Well, I think that's where, I think uh, for us, in terms of app distribution, and I'm, again, I'm not the technical person to be candid in terms of the nitty gritty of the detail, but from my standpoint, and I'll let my, let my team worry about that, but one of the things I think that's important is from a, is we have the platforms with like Apple and Android for the availability. But in terms of drive awareness to get the distribution, we always try to connect that to our, main, our mainline marketing initiatives. So we don't let a, uh, an app go uncommunicated in TV or in regular print or in other media because that's how we drive the activation over to, or in our Facebook activation, drive it over to there. But I hope that answers your question. I'm not the technician in terms of the distribution strategy, but we want to create awareness, drive them to the places they expect to find an Android store or uh, iTunes so that they can get the apps. Hi, uh, Shane Smith from Digitas. So a lot of great work there. Um, what's your future kind of focus around the point of purchase and how you kind of engage a consumer there via mobile? Well, I think, uh, you know, without going into a lot of proprietary discussions with people that we work with. I think, I think one of the things that it is exciting is the whole capability around geo. So it will be, to me, the thing that will be very, uh, very interesting in that, in geo, is where will the limits go in terms of the access to information, you know, given privacy rights. So already I have to ask the question, are you over 21 and to get into the game? But then asking where they are, getting into, getting into a lot of information. But I think for me the most exciting thing is, is if you're in an area with certain bars, and I know my, bars in, uh, my products are in distribution there, and you fit certain, certain criteria that I can target certain messages for certain brands based upon where you are uh, in the insight. So to me, geo, uh, is, geo to me is the big opportunity that we want to continue to push against. Paul. I'm sorry, let's do one more. Yeah, John Doak, CMO for AccuWeather. Uh, you talked about uh, kind of the think before you app. I want to get a sense of how many, uh, from a percentage standpoint, how much better you were doing when you went to the mobile experience uh, compared to the app experience. And also, if you could talk a little bit about how many different types of apps you uh, roll out based on each brand. Uh, we just started in the last couple of months, so I think we're about three or four times the performance already in the first, you know, in the first 30 days, really, of us really ramping up the media weight 
with the new trackyourbud.com versus the app. So significant increase. In terms of the percentage, I candidly haven't tracked the number. You know, because again, I, I don't want to have a metric. It's a false metric. For me, I, I measure my guys on are they delivering engaging experiences? How are we developing our performance from a, a, in, the, in, the, in the consideration ladder? So for me, what's more important is, is the body of work that I'm bringing to the consumer the, making my brands more of a top, building my brands from, are my brands more a top three favorite brand? Are they more of a favorite brand? Are they now a brand lover? So those are the things I monitor. I'm more neutral in terms of you know, paying attention to what, what uh, activation we're doing in any particular technology. Paul Scheib, thank you for starting thank us you. off on a great note. <laughs>